Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're taking our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news on COVID-19 with AMA's Director of Science, Medicine, and Public Health, Andrea Garcia. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Andrea, lots happened since we last talked a few days ago. The big news is about the FDA's authorization of a third dose of the vaccine for people with weakened immune systems. Can you give more details on who qualifies for that and how this would work? Yeah, thanks for having me, Todd. The FDA amended the EUAs for both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines to allow for the use of additional doses in certain immunocompromised individuals. They specifically called out solid organ transplant recipients or those considered to have an equivalent level of immunocompromise. That action allows physicians to boost immunity in those individuals who need extra protection from COVID. Uh, other individuals who are fully vaccinated are adequately protected and do not need an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine at this time. Uh, we know the ACIP is meeting today. They are expected to vote on recommending additional doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines as a part of a primary series. So that they're not putting in that um, language around boosters. It's really a part of the primary series for this population. And we'll have more information from Dr. Sandra Freihofer, who you've heard from several times before about the ACIP's meeting. Uh, Andrea, you know, when you talk about uh, immunocompromised as a population, you know, what kind of uh, size are we talking? What portion of the population do those folks represent? So I think this will depend in part on, on that specific language we see from ACIP, but generally we're talking about about 7 million adults or 2.7% um, who are immunocompromised. And that usually includes people who've received a solid organ transplant, cancer patients, those living with HIV, or those taking immunosuppressive therapies. We know that these populations are likely to experience prolonged infection and shedding, they are more likely to transmit the virus to their household contacts, and they're more likely to have breakthrough infections. So really the emerging data is suggesting that an additional COVID vaccine dose will enhance the antibody response in these populations. And I think Dr. Fauci really explained this well when he said, you know, this is not considered a booster. It's part of what the original regimen should have been in these populations, since they need more vaccines to be protected than the rest of the population. And again, we'll have more details from Dr. Sandra Feihofer about uh, the conclusions from the committee. Uh, Andrea, the CDC also upgraded its recommendation for pregnant people uh, to get vaccinated this past week. What drove this change? Yeah, so on, on Wednesday, we saw the CDC strengthen their recommendation that pregnant people be vaccinated against COVID-19. They pointed to new safety data that found no increased risk of miscarriage among those immunized during the first 20 weeks of gestation. So we previously had data showing that vaccine later in pregnancy was really reassuring in terms of safety and efficacy, but really now we were, we're missing that gap in the, the early stage. And now that that has closed, we've seen CDC move from a permissive pregnant people can be vaccinated to pregnant people should be vaccinated. Um, so really the benefits here outweigh the risks. And I would just note that this recommendation by CDC aligns with what we've seen from both ACOG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. Uh, does that uh, have anything to do with the Delta variant? I mean, I think throughout the pandemic, we've been, been weighing risks and benefits and certainly with the Delta variant surging across the country, uh, we know that there's low vaccine uptake among pregnant people. They're at increased risk for severe illness and complications due to COVID infection. So, uh, you know, really this recommendation to make vaccine for this population, it's more urgent than ever. Um, and so just to, to reiterate there, COVID-19 vaccine is now recommended for all people 12 and older, including people who are pregnant, breastfeeding, trying to get pregnant now or might become pregnant in the future. So that is very simple statement and very clear, uh, which is all people uh, 12 and older, uh, very important. Um, so speaking of vaccinations, are we seeing any movement 
uh, in the numbers or improvement in the numbers this week? You know, it's it's really slow going at this point. The, the numbers are inching upward. It's not significant. Uh, daily doses administered continue to climb. Um, we were administering about 608,000 doses on July 28th compared to around 729,000 doses on August 11th. As of last Friday, the CDC reported about 196 million people who've received one dose of a COVID vaccine. That's 59.1% of the population, and that includes 167.1 million or 50.3 who've been fully vaccinated. And, you know, obviously that's the number one tool uh, for, uh, you know, combating this pandemic. Unfortunately, you know, with that moving so slowly, we are seeing, you know, the, the ticking of the cases and deaths. Um, where do we stand with that right now? So today we're at 36,305,005 reported cases and 619,098 reported deaths. Over the past week, there's an average of 124,200 COVID cases reported each day. That's an increase of 86% from two weeks ago. The number of deaths is up by about 75% to an average of 552 deaths per day for the past week. Four states, Louisiana, Florida, Mississippi, and Hawaii have reported more cases in the past week than in any other seven day period and roughly 68,800 patients per day have been hospitalized. And that's an increase of about 82% from two weeks ago. Astounding numbers and quite a turnaround from where we were early in the summer. And timing could not be worse because here we are about to start school. Many kids are already going back. Um, are we seeing an uptick in pediatric cases? I know I'm seeing a lot of the physicians from the AMA on social media saying that's the case. And what, what are the numbers saying? Yeah, so we are definitely seeing cases among children surging in the US. Uh, doctors are reporting more critically ill pediatric patients than in, in any other point during the pandemic. Um, and we know as more adults get vaccinated, kids are, are making up the an increasing share of COVID cases. Uh, so the AAP reported that between July 22nd and July 29th, kids accounted for 19% of new reported cases of COVID. Um, and the children entering the hospital with COVID, those numbers have been climbing and we're, we're nearly matching those levels from earlier in the pandemic at the peak in January. The Delta variant is, of course, you know, predominant at this point. Um, uh, almost, you know, all, all the cases at this point uh, over ninety percent. You know, are we seeing uh, more severe illness in children than we were before? I don't think we have the evidence to conclude that at this point um, that it's it's resulted in, in more severe disease in this population than other variants. I think what we're seeing is that Delta is more contagious, that people under age 12 are not yet able to be vaccinated. And so we are seeing more kids hospitalized. And I think, you know, that makes sense. If you have more cases, that's gonna trickle down to kids who, who aren't yet protected. And then the best thing we can do at this point is to make sure that those who are eligible for vaccine, who are around kids are, are protected and are vaccinated. And I'm sure this is obviously gonna impact back to school plans. You've got, you know, governors, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, refusing to have a mandate for masking in schools, things like that. It's pretty confusing. You know, what are you seeing out there in terms of back to school plans? Yeah, so I think what we're seeing is uh, really a patchwork of public health intervention emerging across the country. Um, this it's highly contentious. There are a lot of debates going on and, and a lot of anxiety among families, teachers, and education officials. Uh, most of these are centering around vaccination and masks. We know President Biden and federal health officials are emphasizing that um, remote learning isn't the answer here, that we really need to open schools full time this fall. And I think in order to do that and in order to, to not have <laughs> most of the, the class in quarantine that we have to take some, some public health interventions um, to make that in-person learning happen. 
And there's really a spectrum here in terms of how states are reacting, you know, on one end, as I talked about before, you've got uh, Texas and Florida that are, you know, saying no to mandates. On the other end, you've got some states that are far more proactive. What, what are you seeing there? Yeah, so we're starting to see some requirements come into play in, in a few states. Uh, so California is requiring all teachers and staff members to either provide proof of vaccination or to be tested weekly. That applies to both public and private schools. Hawaii is requiring all state and county employees to be vaccinated or tested. So that includes public school teachers. And Denver has said that city employees, including public school teachers, must be fully vaccinated by September 30th. We're also seeing a few states implement mask mandates for schools. So New Jersey, California, and also right here in Illinois, those mask mandates for schools are in place. So for those states that are seeing uh, roadblocks to mandates, what kind of actions are occurring there? Yeah, so Florida, Arizona, Texas, some of the places where we're clearly seeing a surge, they're forbidding districts from implementing some of these public health measures such as, as mask rules. And they're really casting these requirements as an infringement on, on personal freedom and parental rights. I think this is a concerning trend that we're seeing play out across a number of jurisdictions. You know, we've talked about how public health officials are being threatened and harassed, um, but we're also seeing them being stripped of their authority to take action to protect the public. Uh, in some places in, in Texas, we're seeing counties like Dallas that are putting forth legal challenges to the governor's mask prohibition. So I think the question there is going to be whether the local health authority or that or local officials have that ability to adopt evidence-based rules to protect the health and safety of their local communities. Um, I, we know Dallas Public Schools and others are really opposing the mask ban, and they're planning to require uh, everyone on school property to wear masks. This we're, this will certainly be playing out in the courts moving forward. Yeah, and we're seeing, I mean, there's a lot of activity in the court, and I think yesterday's uh, Supreme Court ruling that uh, basically uh, the Indiana University uh, vaccine mandate uh, is still in effect and won't be. Yeah, challenged. that's right. I mean, that was the that was the first case of a, a COVID nineteen mandate to make make it to the court, and and they're really um, upholding that Seventh Circuit opinion there and saying that mandate can stand, which we know is consistent with Jacobson v. Massachusetts. So it's. So for that kind of that level of education at the college level, um, you know, that's a very pretty important ruling. But, you know, as you're pointing out at the you know, younger school level, we still have a lot of action there. Uh, one of those is that the nation's largest teachers union just came out in support of policies that would require teachers to get vaccinated or submit to regular testing. Uh, what's the news there? Yeah, so the National Education Association endorsed COVID-19 vaccine requirements for school workers. This is a shift which could make widespread, widespread vaccine requirements for teachers more likely. Um, I think this is notable because they represent about 3 million members across the country, including many in rural and suburban districts where vaccine mandates may be lower. Um, obviously, this is still a decision that will be made by local and state officials whether or not to mandate vaccines. But I think this is, is an important position for them to take and, and will be influential. So I think one thing we're learning is the situation is fluid. Uh, the solution continues to be to increase vaccination rates uh, at this point, and we'll be paying attention to uh, the latest rulings as uh, the courts see more action here. Uh, Andrea, thanks for being with us today. That wraps up our COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another one next week. Uh, in the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, don't forget to visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.